Welcome to North America. The year is 10,000 BCE, back when winters were even more harsh and deadly than they are now. You must survive the endless winter by gathering more tribesmen to your clan, hunting animals, worshipping idols, building megaliths, and setting up camps to brave the storm. But only the player who builds the most successful civilization after four generations will manage to survive the endless winter. To set up, start by removing all these components. They will only be used in the single player version of the game that I won't be covering in this video. After that, place out the main board, place the round marker on round one, and organize the cards by their different types. There are four identical sets of nine cards, each of a different color, as well as five double-sided chief cards. Set these aside for now. Of the remaining cards, find the five sets of 15 identical cards. These are tribe cards. Each group of 15 cards can be placed face up underneath the space on the board that matches the symbol on each card. After that, grab all Era 1 culture cards, shuffle them, and deal out 8 face up below the board as shown. Place the remaining cards here as a draw pile. After that, place the Era 2 culture cards face down below the Era 1 cards, and place this cap card on top as a reminder not to use this deck until the game enters Era 2. After that, place the sacred stones on the highlighted spaces on the board, being sure to add the right amount for your player count. Error 1 Sacred Stones are placed on the left half of the board, and Error 2 Stones are placed on the right side. Return any unused tiles to the box. After that, each player chooses a color and grabs all the matching components and starting cards of that color, as well as a player board and chief card, choosing either side of the card they'd like. Each player then finds a chief figure that matches their chief card and places their colored base on their chosen chief. All camps are placed on the five spaces on each player's board shown here with the three villages placed below them. Below that, each player places two grey megaliths on the leftmost space of the board here, with the remaining eight of their colour in the leftover spaces beside them. Below that, each player places the burial card into their burial ground shown here, and finally, each player places a cube on the zero value for both the food and tool resources shown on their board, and each player places their score marker face down on the zero space on the board. Moving on, place out the animal board and add the animal deck face down at the top of the board dealing out one card per player plus one face up to the hunting grounds. So four animals for our three player game here. After that, place out the idol board on either side and each player places one of their idol figures onto the bottom of each of the two tracks on the board. Next, grab the lowest value player aid cards for your player count. So in our three player game, the number four card would not be used. Each player takes a random player aid card and a random setup card. The player aid card will determine the player order. The player with the number one player aid card places the tribe marker on the first space on the board here, and the player with the number two card places their marker on the next space, and so on. With the exception of the first player, there is also a starting bonus for each player shown on the card, and each player receives this at this time as well. Now the setup card will show resources and cards that each player will start the game with. The shown food and tools are gained onto each player's board. The symbol here will match one of the five tribe cards below the board. Each player grabs the matching card and adds it to their starting hand. And the symbol or multiple symbols here will match one of the animals in the animal deck. The matching cards are added below each player's board here. Next, each player gathers their starting hands. The tribe card that was gained from the resource card, as well as each player's tribe's woman and Brave card will be in each player's starting hand, and after that each player shuffles their deck and draws two more cards, bringing their starting hand to a total of five cards. After all players have gathered starting resources and cards, set up the terrain board by selecting the appropriate number of tiles for your player count. Place the base terrain tile down, shuffle the remaining tiles, and place them face up in the pattern shown. And with that, each player places their leftmost available camp from their player board onto the base terrain tile. And if a player's starting setup card showed this symbol on it, then at this point they would place an additional starting camp onto the base tile as well. And the final board that needs to be set up is the megalith board. Grab the four megalith tiles and set up the board in a chosen orientation that matches your player count. And with that, the setup is complete, and the first player in turn order can start with their first turn. Starting with the first player and continuing down the player order on the board, each player completes what's called the action phase, consisting of playing culture cards from their hand, placing a figure on the board, and finally discarding any played cards. Once all players have gone through three full turns, the eclipse phase begins, where the player order is changed and players gain eclipse bonuses from various locations. 
Play continues this way for four full rounds. After that, the game is over and scores are added up. The action phase is where the majority of the time in Endless Winter takes place. During the action phase, players take turns going through a series of steps. In order, the current player plays culture cards from their hand, places a figure on the board, completing the shown actions at that location, and then discards any played cards. After the first player has gone through their turn in full, the next player in turn order completes the same series of steps until all players have gone through three full turns. So let's start at the beginning. What are culture cards and how do they work? Culture cards are identified by either an era 1 or era 2 symbol in their top left corner. The majority of them are found below the main board, but each player starts the game with a few generic ones as well. During the playing culture card steps of a player's turn, they may play one, none, or multiple culture cards from their hand to the top of the player board, gaining the instant benefit shown on the bottom of their card here. While multiple culture cards may be played during this step, for each additional card played after the first one, one card from that player's hand must be discarded as a cost. After culture cards are played, or a player chooses to skip this step, the next step of a player's turn is to play a figure on the board and complete the associated actions. Either the tribe or chief figure may be placed at any of the four locations on the main board, or to a player's board here referred to as a rest action. When a figure is added to a location, that player will complete a series of actions shown on the chosen location. The top action or multiple actions in white shown at the chosen location may be completed as many times as a player would like. After that, they slide the figure down to the next available action at that location shown in beige, which they may complete just once. After that, they slide their figure down again, and if they're the first figure at this location, they gain the benefit shown in the circle here. Otherwise, no added benefit is gained, and the next player would start their turn. Let's go over some of the symbols on the board before looking at an example. Anytime you see an icon with an arrow, it is a cost that must be paid to receive the benefit listed beside it. So one tool would be paid to gain the benefit shown here. A common symbol you'll come across is this one, which represents a labor cost. Labor can be spent by playing a number of cards from your hand to the top of your board. Think of these characters on the cards working to complete the task required and therefore fulfilling the labor requirements to complete the chosen action. Only tribe cards generate labor and the labor value of each tribe card is shown in the top left corner here and after a tribe card is played, any added ability shown here may be activated as well. So for example, the crafter pays for one labor, but if that labor is being used towards the matching location on the board, then that card would grant one additional labor when used for that action. Labor can also be paid by passing the labor icon on your board by spending food. This will make a little more sense once we go over the actions on the board. So with that, let's take a look at each location. If a player places a figure at the initiate location on the board, the top action allows that player to pay one tool and one labor to put a tribe card into their hand. This action may be done as many times as a player would like, paying the tool and labor costs each time, but a different tribe card must be chosen each time and any drawn tribe cards may not be spent for labor that round. After a player has completed the top action as many times as they would like, they slide the figure down and may complete the action shown here, which is to pay one food to put any tribe card into their discard pile and put any card from their hand, discard pile, or play area into the burial ground. The buried cards will be removed from the game and go towards end of game scoring. After that, the first person at this location gains the benefits shown here, which is to bury another card and to move one of their two idle figures up one space on the chosen track. We'll come back to the idle track at the end of game scoring. If a player decides to place a figure at the develop location, the top action allows that player to pay three labor to add to their hand one of the face up culture cards below the main board. After this action has been done as many or few times as that player would like, they slide the figure down and complete the action shown here, which is to gain a sacred stone. In round 1 and 2, only the sacred stones from error 1 may be selected, and in round 3 and 4, any of the revealed sacred stones may be chosen. But either way, after a sacred stone is chosen, that player adds it to the leftmost available spot on the player board here, paying any food and tool costs shown and gaining any matching benefit shown on the board as well. Sacred stones have a variety of different abilities that will activate during each eclipse phase. And again, the first player to place a figure at this location gains the benefit shown here, which at this location is to gain one food and one tool resource. If a player chose to place a figure at the migrate location on the board, the top action would allow that player 
to either pay one tool to place a camp onto the terrain board or to pay one labor to move any of the previously played camps one space. Either of these actions may be completed as many times as that player would like, in any order, as long as they pay the required cost for the matching action. When a camp is placed, the left most available one on the player's board must be selected and it must always be placed on the base terrain tile on the board. After the top actions have been completed as many times as the current player would like, they slide the figure down and may complete the action shown here, which is to pay three food to remove any three camps they have on the board in the matching pattern to place one village on the board in its place. Villages can never be placed adjacent to the base terrain tile and villages and camps help players achieve benefits during the eclipse phase, which we'll see a little later. And as always, the first player with a figure at this location gains the benefit shown here, which is the option to place another camp on the board and move one camp, one space. If a player chose to place a figure at the hunt location on the board, the top action at that location would allow the current player to either pay one labor to add two animal cards to the board from the top of the deck, or that player may pay one tool and one labor to draw any revealed animal card from the board and add it below their player board here. Animal cards grant players points at the end of the game. The more of a specific type that player has, the more points they'll score. But apart from scoring a player points, animals can instead be tipped to grant that player an immediate benefit shown on each card. After the top actions have been completed as many times as that player would like, they slide the figure down and can choose to tip any one animal they have, gaining the one-time effect shown on the chosen card. And as always, the first figure at this location gains the benefit shown here, which in this case is to draw the top card from the animal deck and add it to their board. So that's how the four locations on the board work. When a player's chief is placed instead of a regular worker, then its ability on the card may activate any time that turn. And after a player has visited a location, any played cards are then discarded and the next player in turn order completes their turn. Each player has one final location option though. If a player decided they didn't want to visit any of the four locations on the board, they could instead place one of their figures at the top of their player board here to do what is called resting. When a player rests, they may draw one card from their deck and choose to tip one animal, gaining the immediate benefit shown on the card. Resting will also grant each player one and a half labor during the eclipse phase. Speaking of the eclipse phase, let's go over that now. Once all players have gone through the action phase three times and are therefore out of figures, before entering the eclipse phase they decide on a number of cards to place face down at the top of their board. Once the eclipse phase begins, each player reveals their selected cards simultaneously and players compare the labor values shown on the cards. If any culture cards were played, they are then returned to that player's hand since they don't have any labor value on the card. They are only played as a bluff, causing other players to play more cards than they may need to. The player who has the highest combined labor value between their played cards and labor from the completed rest actions will be the new first player and the player with the second highest revealed labor will be the second player and so on. If players ever tie with labor values then the player currently lower in turn order will get the advantage. Once turn orders have been adjusted players will take turns getting the eclipse benefits shown by this icon. The first player in the new turn order gains the benefit shown beside their turn marker. After that, the current player gains any Eclipse benefit from revealed cards, in this case two tool resources, and the option to bury another card. After that, the current player gains any benefits shown on terrain tiles where their figures have the majority. Each camp is worth one strength for the tile it's on, and each village grants two strength for all three tiles it's touching. If there's any tie for majority, then both players will receive the listed rewards. And finally, after the current player gains the benefits from the terrain board, they move to their player board and gain any points from the bonuses shown on their sacred stones, so one point for each different type of tipped animal in this case. After gaining benefits from any sacred stones, the current player moves on to gaining cards and resources from any revealed icons on the board here. After the first player in turn order has gained all eclipse bonuses, then the next player in turn order gains their eclipse bonuses in the same way until all players have gained their respective bonuses. One thing I should mention that people sometimes get hung up on is at any point throughout the action or eclipse phase, if you're gaining a bonus for any reason, then what's called a lesser bonus may be selected instead. The chart beside the play area shows the hierarchy for bonuses, so for example if a player were to gain an idle bonus throughout the game, a tool or food may be chosen instead since they're considered to be a lesser bonus. Before moving on, there's one more symbol on the eclipse board that we haven't covered. 
This symbol represents a megalith. Whenever a player gains a megalith bonus, they take their leftmost available megalith from their player board and place it onto the megalith board. Any bonus they cover up with their megalith is immediately gained. The first megalith to be played by any player must be placed in one of the four grey starting locations, gaining the benefit shown on the board. After the first megalith is placed, any future ones played by any player may be placed adjacent to ones already on the board or in another starting space, but keep in mind that only the grey neutral megaliths may occupy these starting spaces. Other than gaining benefits from the board, megaliths can also be played on top of a group of four previously played tiles, and when that happens, a current player gains two points for every one of their tiles they cover, and just one point for every neutral tile. For every tile covered belonging to another player, both players gain one point as well. So if a red player played a megalith here, they would gain two points for their tile they cover, and one point for each of the neutral and green megaliths. But the green player would also gain two points because two of their tiles were covered. Now after all players have completed the eclipse phase, move on to the preparation phase, where you advance the round marker, remove all figures from the board, refill the hunting ground, so there's once again one more face up animal than your player count, and if entering round 2, refill any culture cards with ones from the age 1 deck. If entering round 3, remove all face up culture cards and deal 8 cards from the age 2 deck, and if entering the 4th round, simply refill the face up display with cards from the age 2 deck again. And after that, all players draw 5 cards. Now there is no hand limit, so saving cards up for future rounds is often a strategy players will use. Now after the 4th Eclipse phase, the game is over and scores are added up. And I think now is as good of time as ever to cover the final board in the game to understand this better. The idle board will score players points at the end of the game. The idle board has two tracks, an offering track on the left and an honor track on the right. Apart from granting any one-time effects listed here throughout the game, each track will grant end of game points. On the offering track, the ratio beside the current section each player ends a game in will determine how many points each player will score from leftover food and tools. So for example, if a player had a combined total of 8 leftover food and tools at the end of the game, and they finished in the 4-1 to one section here, then their 8 leftover resources would only score them 2 points. But if they finish the game at the 1 to 1 section at the top of the track, they would instead gain 8 points at the end of the game. Each additional idol gained beyond the top of the offering track will score a player an additional 1 point throughout the game as well. Now the honor track works a little different and is a little bit more competitive. Whoever ends a game at the top of the honor track will use the first chart here to gain points for cards they have buried by the end of the game. So 15 points if a player has 7 or more buried cards at the end of the game. The second highest player on the track will use the middle value shown here for buried cards, and the third and fourth player will use the rightmost chart here as long as they moved up the honor track at least one space. The first player to move up to a new row on the honor track is said to be in the lead, and the next player to reach the same row would occupy the space beside them, and so on. So it's imperative the players get to a higher level on the honor track first. After points from idle tracks are added up, each player adds any points shown on their tribe or culture cards. And finally, any animals that haven't been tipped throughout the game grant each player the value shown on the card matching how many of that type they managed to collect. So 12 points in this case. After that's been added up, the player with the highest score wins the game. And in the case of a tie, the player currently higher on the turn order track will win. So that's how you play Endless Winner. Uh, really quick, there's a few final things I want to go over. In the rulebook on page 19, there's a list of modules that you can add to the game. Uh, once you're familiar with the game, these can be added in to kind of change the variety of the game, to add a new, few new things. Um, they're very easy to figure out, though. They're on page 19 of the rulebook. I just wanted to mention that those are there if you um, are very familiar with the game and you want to add those in. Another thing I want to address is in the video for the Eclipse phase, I said that you get your, um, your bonuses from the Sacred Stones and then the cards and then the bonuses on the board. Um, in the rulebook, it was a little bit vague on the order um, that you're supposed to do that. It had a 1, 2, and 3 in the rulebook, but it didn't say that you actually have to do it in that order. The order that I showed is the order that I do things in it, uh, left to right, kind of like reading a book. But um, it's, it was kind of vague on if you get to choose the order or if you have to do it a specific way. So I'll leave that up to your discretion, what order you want to gain the bonuses. But um, it only matters in the case of one specific sacred stone is only going to make a difference. So it's not going to change things too much. Only the one that for points for idols is going to make a difference on the order that you do it. But as I say, it was a little bit vague on 
what order you do it in. So I'll leave that up to your discretion on how you want to do that. But um, other than that, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments down below. I'll be happy to answer anything I can. And other than that, thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for more videos.